The pandemic caused so many unforeseen ripple effects that changed life in America. One of those was a surge in loneliness that was followed by a rush of pet adoptions. Now, nearly 18 months later, new pet owners are grappling with the responsibility of caring for a pet who may be looking at a decidedly different future, spending most of their days home alone for the first time as workers start heading back to the office. Well, we're going to talk about what you need to know to help your pets cope with their anxieties with two experts on pet behavior. Dr. Nicholas Dodman, he's the diplomat of American College of Veterinarian Behaviorists, and Dr. Stephen Zawistowski is an adjunct professor of animal behavior and conservation at Hunter College. He goes by Dr. Z. So the organization Shelter Animals Count runs a database that tracks shelter and rescue activity. The group recorded 26,000 more pet adoptions in 2020 than the year before. It's a rise of 15%. Why do you think so many people decided to adopt animals during COVID? One of the things we've known for years is that when there is a uh, social upheaval of some sort, we do tend to see um, a lot of things change at the animal shelter at the pet level. And we have seen, uh, you know, we often see either an increase in adoptions or an increase in relinquishments. So the most recent one that really showed was the Great Recession which was what, about 15 years ago. And during that period, we had an enormous number of uh, uh, evictions occurring because people couldn't pay their mortgage, they were being evicted. And we do know that one of the most common reasons for relinquishment for pets is change in household circumstances. Um, you know, you're evicted, you have to move, um, there's some change, you lost your job. Um, this will lead to often an increase. And on top of that, you know, we're layering um, the behavior problems that we'll see in pets. And that's always been something that comes up about um, when when people are having a difficult time uh, coping with all the other things happening in their life. And they have a pet who's, um, you know, maybe destroying things around the house. They haven't really fully house trained the pet. Um, the pet's not used to being alone, those types of things. So those mm-hmm. all kind of Uh, merge together and result in people bringing their pets back to the shelter. That makes sense about the income situation as well. Dr. Dodman, you know, we've seen pets being returned to shelters as people are returning back to the offices or, you know, going back to some of their old lifestyles. The Animal Care Centers of New York saw almost 1,400 animals being brought back to them last month. That's more than twice the number of dogs and cats that was surrendered back in February. Why do you think pets are, are being returned? Getting a dog during the pandemic was almost impossible at these shelters. Is that equilibrium restored? Well, I think a lot of people um, acquired the pet in the first place because they were sequestered or stay at home program and they just felt, you know, left out of society and it seemed like a good idea to get a pet for companionship. And it turns out that really did work. Um, one study showed something like 60 to 70 percent of people really got a great boost from having a pet around in their loneliness. But now, the other end of that um, situation is occurring, that is people are returning to work and they're wondering what to do with the pets because they were able to spend all kinds of time time with them, playing, taking them for short walks. Um, and some of these pets have not been used to being left alone at all. And when mm-hmm. they go back, they feel guilty. And it turns out there's so many people in that boat that you can't get hardly a dog walker Um, the daycares are brimming over, that switch from people being at home to not being at home is a sudden change, and sudden changes often precipitate separation anxiety, which is rife anyway. It affects up to 17% of U.S. dogs. But for dogs who've been cosseted at home with owners around all the time, I think that's Mm -hmm. an even crueler blow to suddenly be without the person. Mm. So Dr. Z, what's the emotional effect on dogs, of dogs on people, especially during stressful times like the pandemic? Well, we've, we've seen a lot of research over the years showing that uh, simply being in the presence of a dog, petting a dog can lower blood pressure um, and have a lot of impact on uh, even changing some of the hormone 
uh, flow within the body of both you and the dog. Um, so I think sometimes when we're talking about separation anxiety, and particularly for people who um, acquired pets during the pandemic, I, I wonder almost if there's as much separation anxiety for the people as it is for the dogs, because they have become so dependent on having the dog there. Um, you know, now going to work and all of a sudden, you know, you don't have the dog. And, and the, built into that is, is uh, I, I think, a guilt element as well. You feel bad that you leave your dog home alone. I think there are times we overthink that question. Um, you know, when when people, you know, the the vast majority of dogs do just fine being home during the day. Animals have a tremendous sense of timing. We've seen this from research and laboratories and stuff. You know, 20 minutes before you get home, the dog gets up, he stretches, he, he starts looking out the window. When you come home and he's at the door, you have the feeling he's been waiting for you all day. <laughs> and, you know, nah, he's been sleeping most of the day. And I think the most important thing is easing back into a schedule, walking them, exercising them before you go to work, you know, when you would take them out, when you come home from work. So that's incredibly important um, is, is they really do thrive on that. It makes it so much easier in all the training. If you're consistent, um, you can't expect the dog to be consistent if you are not. From a behavioralist standpoint, people might not know or fully understand about dogs. Um, we have a problem sometimes, I think, if we anthropomorphize them. We think mm -hmm. they're, they're little people. Um, and that's a discredit to little people and dogs. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the reality is um, they live in a different sensory world. They hear things that we don't hear. They smell things we don't smell. And they have a different perspective on, on how the world is working. I do. I treat my dog almost like a, a little kid. I, I have to admit it, like talk to it. I tell it, you know, what I'm doing next and, and get angry at it when it pees on the floor. And what are some of the things you think new dog owners might not know about the behavior of a dog that might help them better understand the first few months and years? I agree with Stephen that some people um, over anthropomorphize their dogs and um, you know come home from work and tell them all the troubles they've had on a difficult day and expect the dog to understand it. And dogs really don't do sentences. Um, yeah, they can do little phrases, you know, go get your you know, ball or toy, and they can, they can identify numerous words. I've always believed that they have feelings and emotions that in many ways are very similar to our own. Um, and in my last book, Pets on the Couch, I detail pretty much almost all the conditions in the Diagnostic Manual of Psychiatry can also be found in domestic dogs, from PTSD to different types of anxiety disorders, to explosive aggression, to obsessive compulsive disorder, and so on. So I think they're more like us than a lot of people um, understand or care to acknowledge. And some of the work that's going on at Emory um, with MRIs is showing that same areas of the brain light up on a PET scan um, when they see a familiar face, a familiar person, the reward systems light up. So really, the operating system is very similar. Maybe it's like an old um, Commodore computer versus our you know, latest Mac. Um, but either way, it works pretty well. I do treat my dog, I'm afraid. Um, well, no, I'm not really afraid, like a person. And I've got a T-shirt that says, if, my, if I can't bring my dog, I'm not going. <laughs> <laughs> but see, this is what happens. I didn't quite get it until I became a dog owner recently. How much you love that dog and would do anything for that dog. Do you think that with more people getting animals, particularly during this pandemic when it was so lonely, Dr. Z, do you think that there is a better understanding of dogs and pet culture? Or do you see the fact that people returning them just see this as sort of disposable and can be easily removed from your life? We're in an interesting period of time regarding dogs and, and our understanding of dogs and, and the other animals that we have in our homes. For a long time, there was the thought that dogs were some kind of corrupted version of wolves. Um, wolves were like the ultimate canine, 
Um, and dogs were just some sort of deteriorated version. And, you know, now we're seeing that, no, dogs are actually probably the most adapted species in the world. I mean, they have gone everywhere that humans have ever been. Um, and I'm presuming at some point they're going to end up on the moon. And so I, I see now people are becoming interested in this. I mean, what's striking is, um, you know, the number of articles you're seeing in popular press, not just in the doggy world press and publications, but, you know, the Washington Post, the New York Times, hey, we're doing this podcast right now, right? I mean, would, would there have been interest in this five years ago, 10 years ago? And I think what's driving a lot of this is, is people want to know a little bit more about the creatures that are with them. I mean, I have this snoring beagle right here underneath the table. How are we understanding them? Um, and, and are we, and I, and I hope that as we understand them more, we're doing better for them. Dr. Dodman, based on the research and your understanding of dogs, what do you think are basic things that dog owners do that can dramatically affect their behavior? They did a study looking at owner personality and the influence of the personality on the dog's behavior. Mm -hmm. And sure enough, there is a connection. It's not a, you know, 100% that if you're a nervous person, you'll have a nervous dog, but it moves in that direction. The contribution of, you know, in general, of your personality to your dog's behavior is about 15%. You know, some others will come from genetics, some will come from past experiences and so on. But 15% is uh, due to you. On yeah. that note, do you mind if I bring in my dog, Colonel, for you to say hello? Sure. <laughs> Wolf, Colonel, do you, do you see Dr. Dodman? Do you see Dr. Z? 